Better run. Oh. <laughs> Welcome adventures. So when I was growing up, I spent a lot of time with my grandpa and if he had his tools, I swear he could make things that would rival any game system that's out there today. And if all he had was his knife, he could walk over to the wood pile and just make swords, uh, rubber band guns, slingshots, traps, just any number of things. So I actually teach a um, nothing but knife primitive um, crossbow that I learned from the books of knowledge as a kid. And um, I teach that in my adult classes. And I thought maybe we could reverse engineer that as a way to practice some knife skills for adventurers that are old enough. And for if you've got little adventurers, if you do this for them, they'll watch you with the knife. They'll get interested so that they learn safety and so that they want to learn this stuff later on. You practice some great little notches and then between letting them decorate this thing and just shoot different stuff, uh, you've got hours of backyard enjoyment right here. And if you need a few minutes, I know a lot of people are at home now that aren't used to it. Uh, this is definitely the way to go. I looked at this project in such a way I want you to be able to do it with anything you could find. So even if you have two pieces of small wood that you have to glue together, that's fine. Just make sure you get your two flat sides together on the top and you stay away from any splintery surfaces and you just want it to be thick enough that whatever it is you want to shoot out of this crossbow can rest on there. So right here would be about the thickness of a wine cork and like I said smooth up on top so that it'll shoot off without uh, breaking the rubber band. Any old piece of wood you find around the backyard, even old pieces of fence work, now we'd need to sand this one, it's awfully rough and we don't want any little adventures getting splinters. Pay special attention to blemishes. If there's a, a knot or a hole or any kind of a staple, these things are gonna make your carving much harder than it needs to be. Heck, you can even go to your old wood pile where you've been doing crafts. Here's an old spoon that didn't quite work out. Got some firewood. Ooh, here's a nice piece. It's even got a little bit of a bend to it that feels kind of like a musket. Little piece of cedar. This is perfect. For explanation purposes, I'm going to use an old piece of trim so that you can see every line. I'll be able to draw on here so you can follow along. But remember, you do not have to have a finished piece of wood to do this. Grandpa just used to pull out his pocket knife, walk over to the wood pile, and he would make a lightsaber or some other miracle, and that's what we're after. So we're gonna look at sizing everything up um, and we're just working backwards from the primitive crossbow that I teach in my classes. And uh, we'll get this size to each and every little adventure. First, we wanna start, you need a piece of wood about the size of your little adventure's fingertips down to their elbow. This is gonna give you lots of room for cutting off pieces. It'll end up shorter in the long run, uh, but you need that extra space for cutting away. So I've marked it there. That's where we're gonna do a cross cut. So we'll have the piece of wood we're working with. And then, remember we're gonna have a, a bow and arrow, well a bow anyway, on the top of this to make a crossbow. So what I'm actually gonna do is I'm gonna split a piece of wood down the length of the wood about the uh, size of my finger. That is gonna give us something we can shave on and make a nice little bow. Uh, and in this case, we're not really shaving it into a bow because we are, because we'll be using a rubber band. But if you wanted to use cord, you could make a real bow. So here's that cross cut we marked. We're gonna use what's called a plumber vise, which to do that, allow a three fingers minimum of space between your flesh and what you're cutting. And see how it's pinched in between my legs? That is a great way to cut anything when you don't have an adventure to help you hold. Now remember, I'm just using a pocket knife, but you can certainly use tools to help you with all this. I just wanna show you how easy it is to uh, create some adventures. We're just gonna cut all the way across. So remember, we're not just making a crossbow, we're practicing all kinds of skills. And this plumber's vise will allow you to get so much mileage when you're doing crafts out in the field. Don't forget to let your little adventure help any way that they can, uh, because it's gonna really help personalize the entire adventure. Now let's look at a technique called batoning. First off, this knife is too small to baton this piece of wood. At a minimum, you need two fingers of blade sticking out from the other side of the wood. So that big old hickory there would work perfectly. But even this mora is still gonna be too small. It doesn't have the two fingers sticking out. So I would have to use another technique. If you do baton, having a full tang blade is best. That means 
that the same piece of metal that is the knife goes all the way to the handle. With a folded knife, the tang doesn't go into the handle at all. And then even this more is a partial tang, which if it was the right length, um, if it's a well-made knife is okay, but full tang is best. Now you also want to make sure to have something to put your wood on because we don't want the knife to go into the rocks and chip. So that's what the piece of wood underneath is for. Then you get yourself a decent piece of wood, not too big, a lot of people overdo it there, just a couple wax and you should be right through the wood. Now go ahead and open your saw and we're actually going to cut across the wood. Now we've just got a little tiny saw, so we're going to have to flip this wood back and forth. And I went back about four fingers from the end. You want to surface about four fingers or more so that you can strike this on something later. Now I am cutting across the grain and I am having to flip this wood back and forth. What I'm doing is I'm creating a stop cut that when I whack this wood later, force is going to travel down the wood and end at this stop cut and it's actually going to pop the piece of wood out exactly the way I want. You can use this same method just by doing it on one side and then the other to create a hearth board for a bow drill or any number of flat planes for crafts you need to do. So see, when we hit the wood, force traveled down the length of the wood and ended at that stop cut. Anytime you need a flat plane, whether it's for bow drill, for making a spoon, or for making a crossbow, this is a valuable technique. You can flip it over, do it again on the other side, and have a plank of wood. Or, here's another trick when you can't use your regular knife to baton. In the same direction you would baton the wood, use the saw of your knife to cut a notch about a half an inch. This will be a shear line for your wedge later. Now using any piece of scrap wood, carve a wedge. Place the wedge into the shear line you made earlier, and then baton the wedge as you would your regular fixed blade knife. Because I can see the grains of this wood, because it's a soft wood, because I can see there's no knots, and because my blade is plenty long enough, and most importantly, I can back it up so that I don't hit the spot where it folds, the weak spot, I am comfortable batoning this type of wood, but I would only do that with smaller things. Otherwise, I'd use another tool or one of the other techniques. Now I'm just going to lightly tap, because I am using my pocket knife, and it'll start to split. Now if I wanted to here, if I was worried, I could just make that beginning and I'm just grabbing a random piece of wood here. I didn't even cut a wedge on it. It fits in. Just be careful where the knife falls. You don't want it to chip on the rocks. You don't want it to cut your legs. And watch, it's going to split right off for me. And it's okay if this doesn't split perfect. It's going to follow the grain of the wood. And we left a little extra because we're going to be doing some shaving anyway. Now we're going to clean this wood up a little bit. We want to get rid of any big pieces that look like they may splinter a child or later on break off when we start carving and shaping this. But we're not going too nuts here. Just sort of get rid of anything, flatten it out a little bit, but it doesn't have to be perfect. I teach a lot of classes with knife and I see this mistake. People push to cut the knife. But remember, a knife is designed to cut when you pull it towards you, like how you would cut a carrot or tomatoes. That's how a knife works. So lock out your wrist and your elbow, pull the wood towards you, but now tip the knife blade up. This is a great trick for people that don't do a lot of knife work. See how it's causing the blade to travel the same way it would when you're cutting tomatoes? Now we're getting the most effect out of our knife. Over time, you'll be able to push and create the same movement. But especially if you're helping a young adventurer to make this project, tipping that knife blade up is a great little hack to cause the knife to work properly when you pull the wood. And you're going to keep from getting tired. And you're also going to keep from running the risk of getting hurt uh, because you're using the knife properly now. Now we need to make sure we have a flat or mostly flat area on both the bow and the base of our crossbow. This does not have to be perfect because we're either going to be using glue or a screw or a lashing to hold it together, um, but the flatter it is, the better it will stick. Now I've got a pretty flat area on my base, pretty flat area on my bow. I'm going to flip the base over 
and start making the hand grip really comfortable for any little adventure. Um, what we want is sort of a rounded or U shape. So I'm gonna be taking off anything that would splinter because we batoned it earlier, but I also want to go after anything that's a 90 degree edge so that no little hands get hurt. Okay, so I'm literally gonna find that point where the two planes connect and we've got that 90 degree edge and I'm gonna let the knife slide down that, not too sharp an angle, I'm just trying to take it off. And then I'm gonna either rotate to the left or the right, find another edge and slide it off. This is the same way we make feather sticks, except for I'm going all the way to the end of my wood because I wanna get rid of all those angles so that when this is slid back and forth in a hand while kids play or if they're roughhousing, um, it should feel really comfortable. There shouldn't be any danger of splinters. And uh, also what we're doing here is we're creating something something that just kind of looks cooler. <laughs> so see how I can rub it in my hands, no splinters, no pain. You can saw, uh, take some sandpaper to this later if you want to, but if you got rid of all the little angles and all the splintering portions, you shouldn't have to. Now handles. Handles always seem to mess people up. Just hold onto the wood about the way that it would be pointing when it's a crossbow, and from the crook of your thumb down to the angle of the wood, that's the line you want to follow to make a handle. Now what we're going to do is we are, we're going to draw this in so that you can see it, but you could definitely just scratch it in with one of the blades from your knife. And we're not going to try and hack this all off in one piece because we'd probably split out or mess up our handle or possibly even hurt ourselves. So we're going to make a series of relief cuts, just like if we were using a power tool to keep our hacksaw blade from breaking. And these relief cuts are going to act as a stop cut for us, like we used before. It's gonna allow us to apply force in the direction that we wanna make our cut without risking splitting out or hitting anything beyond the, uh, the scope of our blade, like the rock pile there. So I'm literally just sawing down uh, to the area on my knife. You could also baton down if you wanted, if you had just a knife, but that's a little bit riskier as far as messing up your handle. Um, once I've got those stop cuts made, I'm just going to do push cuts, which is um, just literally pushing right towards the stop cut, kind of the opposite of what we did earlier. And I'm going to be able to put that force in there to just split out little pieces of wood to create the perfect little handle shape and make sure that I follow that line without deviating or splitting out or following the grain of the wood. Basically, it's allowing me to use my knife as if I had a hacksaw. While I'm in there, I go ahead and round it out a little bit. That'll just help me later on. Once I'm happy with an area, I make another stop or relief cut, and then I'm just going to proceed uh, to making a stop cut and push cuts towards the stop cut, and then a little bit of shaving. A little bit of shaving to um, make everything closer to the shape I I'll want. You don't need to watch all that. I'll do this a few times until we have something that resembles a handle. The pop-out notch is another little trick to speed things up. I'm just going to put my knife in that hole that I made for the saw, and I'm going to apply force by twisting my blade just a little bit. Don't go all the way down, back the knife up some, and pop! It pops right out. Now I can just continue to shave along. And this is all made possible because of the relief or stop cuts that I made. Let's keep rounding that handle out so it looks good, kind of like a, a musket handle. Those pop-out notches are so helpful. Why don't we take a little bit of a closer look at how we would do that. So all you have to do is you have to have an area to put your knife in. That's where I'm putting it right now. And then you have to have some kind of a stop cut. And you just twist the knife towards the stop cut and then clean it up. And you will get these little Lincoln Log kind of notches. Now little adventurers are learning knife safety by watching you. They're learning that they can do things by watching you. And more importantly, they're starting to get excited because it's starting to resemble something. At this point in time, with a little bit of imagination, they see where you're going. I'm just gonna keep cleaning up this handle a little bit. And I think it's about time to put in a trigger. So let's take a look at how to put the trigger in the right spot. Let your little adventure grab the handle you just made and just kind of see where would the finger fall if this were something where he actually pulled the trigger. Now the trigger on this won't actually work. It's just to make it look and feel cool. Plus it'll make it a little bit more comfortable. I just made a little line with my knife where his finger rested and now I'm sawing in and you're gonna wanna judge how far you saw in by about the size of your little adventurer's fingers. Once again, this is just a stop cut, but now we're gonna make what's called a V-notch by coming in and making push cuts from both sides. Uh, and we're gonna do it a little bit from this side, a little bit from that side. And because we've got that stop cut there, 
what it's actually going to do is it's going to create a little V or once we round it out some a little oval shape. Once again you use this in a lot of skills especially bow drill. So here I'm just coming from one side and it's about time to flip it over and do it again. Let's see if I can find a wood so that uh, I can show you just the V knot through all of its steps. So I've already made the stop cut here and I'm just going to come in from, we'll call this the, the back side I guess because it's the back of that um, stop cut and I'm literally just making little push cuts in and I do a little bit of a scooping motion with my wrist but not much. Um, if you want it to be more rounded you scoop more and if you want it to be more of a V uh, then you scoop less. It just depends on what you need for your trap or the chair you're building or whatever. Now I flip the piece of wood around again and same thing, just some push cuts towards that same initial stop cut. And it's just allowing me to sort of chisel away at this like a beaver until I have the shape that I want or need. In this case for a trigger, but it could be any number of things. Well, you will use notches a lot in your carving, uh, especially if you're gonna use your carving as a bushcraft or camping skill. We've got a little nice shape here going, but I'm going to just round it out a little bit, make it more like a trigger. So I'm going to scoop a little bit more, and I'm also going to see, see I'm using my left thumb here, and not my right thumb, but my left thumb. That's going to allow me to stay really close into the knife, have a lot of control, and really, really shape the wood to whatever it is that I want to have as an end result. So most of the force is coming from my left thumb, but the motion is coming from my right. So I'm pushing with my left and scooping with my right. And you'll see this will turn into a, a nice little semicircle that's going to feel a lot like a trigger. It'll look cooler, it'll make the handle feel better, and um, it's just what we're used to. We're used to seeing anything that shoots having a trigger, right? Now remember, the trigger doesn't actually do anything. Okay, so now let's find about the middle of our bow. I just use my hands to do that, but you could use a ruler or a piece of rope. And I want that to rest right at the edge of the base of the crossbow. Made a little line there for how far back it's going to be. And now let's make a little line for how deep it's going to be. And guess what? We're going to make another stop cut and use a little pop notch to just pop that right out of there. And then we'll clean it up. Once it's cleaned up, the flat surface on our bow should fit right in there. And now we've got a nice little fit that we can nail, glue, lash, or even duct tape together. All right, let's just clean everything up a little bit now and really get it the shape that we want. This is just sort of the nitpicking portion, uh, making it so it's going to look like whatever adventure your little adventure might want to be. Measure twice and cut once. That's what Grandpa used to always say. This is kind of the same idea. Before you get it all put together, it's going to be a lot easier to make modifications, so let them take it for a little test drive, and then we can start attaching everything once we know they like it. Listen to any complaints they have, see how it feels, and let's take just a little bit, a few more minutes here to get everything the shape we want it, um, because that's going to be a little harder once it's glued or lashed. All right, the bow and the base seem to fit, fit together really well. It's nice and flat on top, so my dart will fly. It won't split out the, um, the uh, rubber band. I've got a nice, comfortable trigger. The handle fits Haas's hand. Made one for Scout as well. I am ready to glue this together. Once again, I just use my hands to find the middle of the bow. You want this all to be proportional, otherwise your darts will fly off to goodness knows where. I use a lot of wood glue, but you could definitely use screws. Uh, just make sure here that you make a, um, a starter hole, otherwise you'll split the wood. You could use nails, you could lash it together. I've even done duct tape in a pinch. Let's get it nice and glued up here. And then I'm going to clamp them together. If you didn't have a clamp, you could just hold it for a little while. If you do it that way though, make sure you don't put uh, the force on it, even though it's just a rubber band, for at least a few hours. Otherwise that bow could fly off and hurt somebody's knuckles a little bit. 
Now my little adventures have been coming and going throughout all of this. They've seen nice safety, they've seen me use different tools, they've also learned different cuts, and even though they're not ready to do the project themselves, I've laid the ground for future interests. All right, so this is your actual trigger. I am using a clothespin. You could just tilt it to the side and screw it in there. I'm gonna glue mine as, uh, again. You could also duct tape it if you wanted, but anyway, we're gonna attach that. If you don't have a clothespin, you could use a butterfly kip or check this method out. I just made a seven notch, I'll show you that later, and my thumb can twitch it up like this. Okay, so it'll look about like this. Let's put a rubber band on here. All I do is I twitch my thumb up like I just showed you. Boink! And I've got a trigger. You wouldn't wanna do that with a real crossbow because it could uh, hurt your thumb, but for a rubber band, this is just perfect. Now to make that seven notch, all I did is make another stop cut and I'm going to make a series of cuts towards the stop cut, kind of like I did for the V notch. Don't start towards the back or you see how hard I have to push, see how it's sliding across the top? That's not efficient. We made that stop cut, let's use it. Start close to the stop cut and make little scooping motions with your wrist and just really efficiently, easy as pie, you're gonna make yourself a little seven notch. Remember the scooping. That's one of the, uh, the big physics things that's on your side here. So we'll clean the seven notch up a little bit and then we can look at it. All right, let's just get those pieces out of there. All I'm doing is pushing where that stop cut was. Clean it up a little bit here. Now the seven notch is probably one of the notches I use more than almost anything. It's, it's kind of like the overhand knot of notches. It's amazing. If you, if you can't figure out the right notch, you can probably fake it with a seven notch. Anyway, using that seven notch in a piece of wood with minimal carving, check it out. We can make a quick impromptu rubber band gun. If you really need something for a little adventure really quick, pick up any piece of scrap wood, clean it up a little bit, cut a seven notch in it, teach them that little trick with the thumb I just showed you, and boingo, you've got a rubber band gun. You can feel lots of time this way. So you can also get really advanced with triggers if you want. You actually have to if you're making a real bow. Just make sure that the string will travel up the length of your crossbow. Otherwise it could split the spring or shoot your dart who knows where. As far as attaching our rubber band, you could glue a couple spare pieces of wood onto your bow. You could certainly put some screws or nails in it. Um, I'm just gonna duct tape one, and I'm also gonna use one of my favorite secret tools for little adventures, and that's the old thumbtack. Uh, believe it or not, they'll hold really well in this wood. Plus, you can change out the rubber bands if they break. Now is the hardest part of this whole adventure, waiting for the glue to set. Your little adventurers can see what they've got now, and they are going to be eager and ready. But make sure you wait so that the glue dries, uh, otherwise it could fly off. That is one area where the nails or the screws or the tape is a little bit stronger than glue because you can go immediately. Anyway, we've got something that looks like a crossbow. Let's make some darts. You can use a piece of paper uh, or a piece of cloth. I'm using toilet paper because it's nice and soft. Just fold it in half, then a half again, then in half again. And now I'm gonna roll it up nice and tight. And then I'm gonna roll it up in a piece of duct tape. The duct tape holds it together and makes it so you don't have to make a whole bunch of darts. It'll kind of protect it. It's a protective layer, especially from moisture or from running into things like tree bark and everything like that. Now remember, I do like to go with something soft, but an old piece of scrap fabric from a shirt can be just fine if you don't have a lot of toilet paper, tissues, anything like that. Once you start using things like corks or cardboard, they work great, but they're gonna sting a little bit when they hit something or when they might break things. Now you can load this up so that it looks just like a bullet if you want. You just have to do a little bit of balancing and it shoots great. But here's a little pro tip we've learned through playing with them. If you put your bullets in sideways, some ammunition actually flies better that way. And the really cool thing is it will be able to touch the rubber band on both sides, which means your little adventures can chase each other around, they can chase you around, the, uh, the crossbow can move and the bullets won't fall out until they pull the trigger. Now you can shoot Nerf darts out of this. They fly really well, really accurate. You can also shoot corks. These are great for shooting at cans and such. They sting a little bit if they hit. Uh, that was an earplug. Those work really great, but they're a little hard to find. Tops of water bottles are wonderful, but clown's noses, clown's noses do not work at all. I hope you've enjoyed making this toilet paper launcher. It's a fun little way to spend some time with little adventures and to practice your carving skills. And even if all you've got is a pocket knife and some scrap 
always remember, there is no such thing as a small adventure.